When I first went to Leach's pottery, the first, among the first things I learned was this throwing off the hump, great saver of time. Japanese thing, I suppose Chinese too. But I took to it and I never stopped doing it. I noticed many people who went to the Leach pottery dropped this business after a bit, went back to making up separate lumps, but uh, they, were, they were more industrious than I was. I, it seems to me an enormous advantage. You've saved all the trouble of making up the lumps. I'm one of those potters who use thick slurry instead of water, but it takes a little time to manufacture it. It's, been, it's coming along, there's quite a nice lot coming on now. This is a way of decorating bowls that I worked out when I was in Ghana. We had no means of decorating pots and I wanted to decorate them. And I was also very struck by the fact that the native potters in various parts of Ghana produce most wonderful surface textures by rolling various things over their pots, little, little, little pieces of wood and little pieces of string, and even things like corn cobs. Well, I tried all that and it was no good on thrown ware at all. It didn't work out on thrown stuff. So I evolved this curious business. Of course, that, it's changed since I first did it. It simply consists of making horizontal lines with a stick or a porcupine quill, a porcupine quill, or and then uh, just rubbing them out again with your finger, and it makes an awful mess. You don't have to mind the mess; it comes out. But it leads to a very interesting thing, because all the things I'm doing to it now distort and deform the thrown shape considerably and then one goes over it again restores all that and in doing so one discovers that you can alter the shape of a pot by using only the inside hand provided you provided you're careful the inside hand is the one that really does the work really does the shaping 
And the outside hand is a sort of critic standing by and saying, no, that's not very good. Uh, better come in a bit here. Or come out a little more, please, there. Or go in a bit. I'm going to push you back now, and so on. That's what the outside finger is doing all the time. And... Uh, So you really don't need the outside finger. When I'm doing this, I shut one eye and I use one of my eyes instead. And I just go out like this and keep my eye on what the inside finger is doing instead of always interfering with the outside hand. There's a good general rule of making a pot before you take it or just run over it again from the inside if you can, if you can afford to do it because it's the inside finger that has made the shape and it's the inside finger which keeps it alive. The outside finger really only makes the critical corrections. Now this is rather... fairly stiff clay, so I think it's going to stand up to that treatment all right. Don't think much of that one, but one always be prepared to make a bad one at the beginning. And even cut it off crooked. The only trouble with this Japanese way of throwing is that a potter like me never gets long enough on this type of thing to get really good at it. But there are potters who can cut off with a thread so they don't need to turn. They've always filled me with envy because I find that I always have to turn anything I make this way. Oh yes, and there's a trick about not getting an S crack. I'll show you. Too late for this one. I'll have to make another one show you that. Not getting an S crack is a question of how you open, how you bring up the next lump. You see, one brings up the lump, one guesses the amount of clay one's going to have for the next bowl. Before you start doing that, you mustn't wet it. That's the whole secret. You keep only wet it when you've got it up in the hump. Ah, yes. manufacture some of this thick slurry, I think. When I went back to England in 1965, I went to teach in an art school, I found they didn't know what slurry was. Slurry is a, what stayed further than slip. Slip is a liquid. Slurry is the condition when it's almost solid. Last, we're getting power-driven potter's wheels, which you can also use free. The old type of power-driven wheel was an awful headache because you either have to use the motor or if you stop, the thing just froze. And there's a distressingly great number of such wheels still on the market in America, and a lot of people use them. But the first wheel of this type I met in America was, is, uh, I, I, I saw it in a book, it's called the Randall wheel. I don't 
don't know why, somebody called Randall must have made the first one. But since then I've met the plenty of others, both here and in New Zealand. Saves an awful lot of trouble.